So to summarize um, what I'm going to talk about, diabetes insipidus can occur at the onset of diagnosis of LCH or it can occur at any point later in the course of the disease or after the completion of treatment. Um, in patients with multi-system disease, it appears to happen to almost half of patients. Uh, risk factors include multi-system LCH and craniofacial lesions. And systemic treatment with chemotherapy may reduce the risk, but we don't really know when we're doing a clinical trial to answer that question. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, neurodegenerative changes, that appears to have a later onset. Uh, various series have reported it from being anywhere from about 5% to 25% of patients. Risk factors, again, include multi-system disease and craniofacial lesions. And then patients who have involvement of the hypothalamus or pituitary uh, with growth hormone deficiency or other uh, endocrine changes. There is no clearly effective therapy. And um, you can be um, completely without symptoms but have these changes that get worse over time. And these patients require close follow-up. Um, so, you know, where we are now in 2007, we need to better define what this disease is, collect more information by doing follow-up uh, serial MRI studies, by doing neuropsychological testing in these patients to very carefully quantify what the abnormalities are and to carefully look at the uh, endocrine system in these patients. Um, at a more basic science level, we need to try and understand why diabetes insipidus even occurs in LCH. We don't really know. And then we need to um, develop treatments which can either prevent the development of DI um, or prevent the development of neurodegenerative disease. But I think we're still quite a ways from that. Um, and so I'm just going to mention that you're going to hear in the clinical trials uh, uh, session tomorrow about the uh, LCH-CNS 2003 study. This is not a treatment study. It's really a registry study that makes um, uh, recommendations for evaluation. Um, and patients uh, are eligible who have a biopsy-proven diagnosis of LCH, and on MRI they have some evidence of central nervous system involvement. And this study provides guidelines for doing these MRI studies, for doing the neuropsych testing, and the endocrine evaluations. So there's probably no obvious benefit to you or your child um, if you're eligible to be in this study, but it will certainly make a difference for future generations. And I would encourage you to ask your physicians about this study. And uh, if it's not available at your local institution, contact the association office because there are institutions around the country that can help provide this evaluation. Uh, I want to thank Nicole Grois, who I think uh, most of us would acknowledge is clearly the world's expert in this area. She provided much of the uh, data for this talk and some of the slides. And uh, I'll take a couple of questions if we have um, sufficient time. Regulation of sex hormones is controlled by that same area of the brain. And so uh, some patients who may have diabetes insipidus and or growth hormone deficiency and or thyroid dysfunction, all of those things are regulated by this part of the brain. And so um, hormones are made in, in that part of the brain that regulate production of testosterone and estrogen and those other sorts of things. And so in some patients with LCH, usually patients who already have DI, um, those hormone levels, production of those hormones can be affected. The levels would be low, and patients might not go through puberty or might have a very delayed puberty. And so that, uh, again, I think that evaluation as a part of long-term follow-up is important, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about that in the next talk. Well, that's a great question. You notice I didn't really address that because there aren't any clear guidelines. Um, uh, I think if I were a parent, I want my child to have an MRI scan every six weeks to look for that, but that's not really practical. Um, and it, particularly in younger children, it's not really safe because younger children require sedation for that procedure. So I think we have to balance with our clinical judgment as best we can which patients are at risk and when those scans ought to be done. I think if a child has, has um, you know, uh, a risk for developing that, like a craniofacial lesion, I think an annual MRI scan is a reasonable thing to do. If your child does not have um, uh, you know, a risk uh, for that, if, if maybe there's a lesion on top of the skull, you know, that, the risk for, uh, there is very slightly increased. And um, I don't think that we can make a clear recommendation that an annual MRI scan to look for those changes is going to be um, uh, indicated. The other thing that I would mention, at least for now, 
is that it's not going to necessarily change what we do because there is no effective therapy. So one could be very aggressive in looking for these lesions, but what's going to be the consequence, the result of that? If we find it, all we're going to do is continue to monitor uh, the patient closely because at the present time we don't have any preventative therapy to offer. So, you know, hopefully at some point in the future we will have some sort of strategy to prevent or treat this. And in that setting, it may be much more important to be aggressive about looking for, for those changes. Well, I think pineal gland involvement is much less common, um, uh, but because melatonin can be you know, involved with the pineal gland, that was one of the rationales for using that as a therapeutic treatment. Um, but it seems to be pineal involvement seems to be much uh, less common than, than hypothalamic or pituitary involvement. So I think that um, endocrinologists would be the doctors who would look for the, all the endocrine problems. Um, at, at my institution, if I have a patient who I suspect has diabetes insipidus, um, I will refer them to the endocrinology clinic for a water deprivation test, and they'll usually see an endocrinologist. Um, and they can, you know, the, the test for thyroid deficiency is a simple blood test. The test for um, sex hormone deficiencies is a simple blood test. The test for growth hormone deficiency is a little bit more complicated blood test, but typically we would only do that in patients who seem not to be growing properly. In contrast, the neurodegenerative changes are not something that an endocrine doctor would typically um, be involved with. And so I think you would look to your oncologist to sort of supervise that. And if the patient, certainly if the child develops symptoms, you know, the things I talked about, tremors or um, loss of balance, difficulty speaking, maybe cognitive problems, a neurologist would be the right person for that child to see. Yeah, so that's probably, that's, that would not be considered a, a risk lesion. And, and so patients with, with involvement in those areas seem to have only a very slightly higher incidence of diabetes insipidus than patients um, uh, in the, you know, all LCH patients. I don't think we can say with certainty. Again, it's a, it's a very new area. It's not well defined. Um, I think you know your child would be a great candidate if if um, she's had diabetes insipidus or um, some of these other problems. Um, she's not going to be eligible for the CNS 2003 study. But you know these risk factors are not absolute. I mean, there can be patients I think um, who could have neurodegenerative disease who don't have diabetes insipidus or craniofacial lesions. So that's something that you should discuss with your physician about whether an MRI or neuropsych testing or both might be indicated.